Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> bless us as we open your word. We pray that you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The message for today is entitled, The Great Outpouring and the Seal of God. What we missed. <clears throat> Today I want to tell you the story of a woman, and that woman is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, where the Bible says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, <clears throat> that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. The woman that I want to speak to you about today is the church the bride of Christ. And when I want to, what I want to share with you in particular is her condition just before the second coming. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus is speaking to the church of Laodicea. It is his bride just before he comes again. And notice her condition. Verse 14 says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, <clears throat> These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knoweth, knowest not <clears throat> that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. I want you to notice that this woman is poor, she is wretched, she is miserable. This is her condition shortly before the return of Jesus, and we know this because Laodicea is the last and final church found in the book of Revelation. However, her condition doesn't stay this way. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, here's what we read. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, <clears throat> that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, follow this carefully. The condition of the church of Christ when Christ returns is that she is a church without spot or wrinkle or any blemish. <clears throat> she has been purified by the word of God. However, we read in Revelation chapter 3 that sometime before that, she is miserable, wretched, naked, blind, and poor. The question is this. What is it that changed her from miserable, wretched, blind, naked, poor to not having spot or wrinkle, being a glorious church? What is it that made the change? Well, <clears throat> the Bible tells us in James chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it <clears throat> until he receive the early and latter rain. So let me rephrase this verse. James is writing here and he says, be patient until the coming of the Lord. 
The Lord is coming. He is coming soon. And when he comes, his bride is going to be perfect. Then he, then he says these words. Behold, the husbandman that waits for the precious fruit. What is he waiting for, for that fruit to grow up into its fullness? He's waiting for the early rain and the latter rain. The latter rain brings the fruit to its fullness so that it is ready to be harvested. So if I were to ask you, what is it that moves the church from its Laodicean condition to a church without spot or wrinkle, a woman without spot or wrinkle, a woman that is glorious in the sight of the Lord, <clears throat> the answer to that question would be the outpouring of the latter rain. The outpouring of the latter rain. I want to read a statement to you. It's found in uh, Christian Experiences and Teachings, page 172, and here's what it says. I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. It had effect. Many had been bound, some wives by their husbands, and some children by their parents. The honest, who had been prevented from hearing the truth, now eagerly laid hold upon it. All fear of their relatives was gone, and the truth alone was exalted to them. They had been hungering and thirsting for truth. It was dearer and more precious than life. I asked what had made this great change. An angel answered, <clears throat> It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. So I need you to follow this, guys. The outpouring of the latter rain is what moves the church from being in its present condition to its condition where it is without spot or wrinkle, where it is a glorious church in the eyes of the Lord. We know this to be the case because I want you to notice Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, the closing of the third angel's message, here's what it says. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, I'm going to skip a verse and go to verse 14. Notice this. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud, one sat like unto the Son of Man, having, a, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Pause for a second. What is it that made the harvest of the earth ripe? Yes, it was the outpouring <clears throat> of the latter rain. So I want you to notice this, putting this together, the church currently is in a Laodicean position or condition. But before Christ returns, she will be a church without spot or wrinkle, ready to be harvested. What moves the church from being in its Laodicean condition to being ready to be harvested? It is the outpouring of the latter rain. Meaning then, listen carefully, listen carefully to me, the church is in need of the great outpouring of the latter rain. Stay with me. Stay with me. If you're following me so far, just give me an amen so I can know, Pastor, we get you so far, we are following. Now, I want you to listen carefully because in order to find out how we can get the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that's what we all want to know. How can we get the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? In order to tell you how, because there's an answer, I'm going to show you the answer right now. In order for us to understand the how, I'm going to share with you a story of another woman. This woman, listen carefully, this woman is not found in the New Testament. 
She is found in the Old Testament. So let's go to the book of 2 Kings chapter 4. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to begin with verse 1. The Bible says here, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. All right, guys. <clears throat> Here we have this woman. This woman. Let me pause for a moment longer. Here we have this woman who is in debt, meaning she's poor. <clears throat> She's perhaps miserable. We might even say that she is wretched. <clears throat> she has issues. Her husband is dead and the creditor is coming to take her sons. She is in a wretched condition, this woman. And the Bible tells us in the very next verse, verse 2, Elijah said unto her, what shall I do for thee? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, thine handmaid has not anything in her house. She's miserable. She's wretched. She's poor. <clears throat> she does not have much. She's in a bad situation. All she has is a pot of oil. I need you to catch that. She's become so poor all she has is a pot of oil. That's all. <clears throat> I think I could probably end my sermon right here because I think, you, I think you see, you already see where this may be going. All she has is a pot of oil. Now, what is oil symbolic of in the Bible? Oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So, so watch this. All she has left is a little oil. We don't know why. We don't know how she got into this situation. All we know is that she is destitute. Listen to me, guys. Our church started out in 1844. We were rich in faith. We were rich in action. We were rich in expectancy. We were rich in unity. We were rich in love. We were rich in the spirit. But something began to happen. We began to lose something. By, by 1888, God was trying to bless the church because he saw that we were on a trajectory to losing much. But we rejected that 1888 message and, and lo and behold, uh, we now find the condition in our church is miserable, wretched, <clears throat> all those words you want to use. We look at the condition of our church. We look at the condition of our church and what do we see? We see our arguments. We see the disagreements. We see our pride. We see the lack of growth as we should be growing. A and for many of us, it seems like all we have left is a pot of oil. <laughs> all we have left of that rich heritage, all we have left of that rich beginning, for many of us, it seems like we just have a little of the spirit left within us. <clears throat> and now you can begin to understand why God says that this church his church is miserable and wretched and blind and naked. Why? All we have is a pot of oil. But beloved, there is good news. Because listen carefully, all she had was all she needed. Let, let me say that again. <laughs> all she had, even though it wasn't much, all she had was all she needed. Or we might say, all she needed was all she had. What do you have in your house? A pot of oil. 
a pot of oil. So, what does Elijah tell her to do? <clears throat> I hope you're following me, guys. This woman has nothing but a pot of oil. It's not a lot of oil. It's a pot of oil. I don't mean to be rhyming right now, but you get the idea. She doesn't have a lot. She only has a little. And as I look at our church today, and as I look at all that's going on, and as I look at the condition, and as I look at the condition of the church through God's eyes, yeah, it seems like we don't have a lot. We're poor. We don't have a lot. So notice what Elijah says, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 3. Elijah says this, then he said, go. <laughs> Wait a minute. I got to read this slow. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. Pause for a second. <laughs> in order for this woman to get out of the condition that she was in, she had to do something. She had to go interact with her neighbors. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I just need to pause for a second and let that sink in for just a moment. She had to go and borrow vessels, empty vessels from her neighbors. She had to go interact with her neighbors and take her neighbors' empty vessels. Man. She had to take her neighbor's empty vessels and bring them into her home. Bring them into her house. And the Bible says, verse 4, when you are coming to the house, when you are coming, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shall pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. In other words, beloved, listen carefully. It is only when she began pouring out into her neighbor's empty vessels that something began to happen. I'm going to take a sip while you just contemplate what you just heard. We want the outpouring of the Spirit. We want God to pour out His Spirit into us. But He's not going to pour out His Spirit into us until we start pouring out into our neighbors. Our church must take the little oil that it has and as a body as a as the woman as the bride of christ begin a massive vessel effort go out and and seek out your neighbor's empty vessels you understand beloved that the world is full of empty vessels full of them Full of people who do not have Christ dwelling in their hearts. Full of people who are oppressed. Full of people who are in need. Empty vessels. Elijah says, go borrow these vessels, bring them into your sphere, and pour out into them. Pour out into your neighbor's empty vessels. And as you do this, the Spirit of God will fill your vessel. The Spirit of God will pour out into you. Beloved, the, the, the third angel's message, the light that is to lighten the whole world, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will not come until God's people know what it means to pour out into our neighbor's vessels. We need a massive oil pouring campaign. We need a united oil pouring campaign amongst us. 
There are empty vessels, beloved, out there. Empty vessels. That, that can be from sex trafficking to prostitution to poverty to racism to child abuse to drug abuse to domestic violence. There are empty vessels out there that God says, if you want the outpouring of the Spirit of God, what I need you to do is start pouring out into these empty vessels. Manuscript, volume 1, page 177. Every truly converted soul will be intensely desirous to bring others from the darkness of error into the marvelous light of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The great outpouring of the Spirit of God which lightens the whole earth with His glory will not come until we have an enlightened people who know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. Not until, listen, I'm not finished with the quote, not until we start out pouring into others, pouring out into others, pouring out into our neighbors, empty vessels, will the great outpouring of the Spirit of God happen within us. When, I'm, I'm continuing to read, when we have entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of his spirit without measure, but this will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. God cannot pour out his spirit when selfishness and self-indulgence is so manifest. When a spirit prevails that if put into words would express the answer of Cain, am I my brother's keeper? You need to catch this, guys. God will not pour out the Spirit into a church that is basically saying, that's not my concern. Am I my brother's keeper? All I need to do is just preach the third angel's message, preach the gospel, and let the other stuff handle itself. No, 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 no. We must learn what it means to pour ourselves out into others. By the way, when you pour yourself out into others, that is how you empty self. Let me say it again. When you pour yourself out into others, that's how you empty self. If you're pouring yourself into yourself, you will never empty self. And as a church and as a people, we spend so much time pouring into ourselves that that self is never emptied to empty self you've got to pour it out into a different container are you catching what i'm saying notice with me verse 5 so she went from him and shut the door upon her sons, upon her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil was stayed. <clears throat> you guys watch this. <laughs> no pouring out, the oil is stayed. You want oil? Start pouring. Look, I got a cup here. I can't pour this cup into this cup. I have to pour it into another cup so that then God can put into this cup what he wants to put in. So if I'm pouring self out into another cup, that leaves empty room for God to pour in his spirit. Are you catching what I'm saying? God is trying to fill us, but he can't fill us if we're filled with self. All right. Watch this. Watch this. Why is the woman doing this? Why is the woman going to Elijah? All right. You remember what she said? The creditor is coming. In other words, the woman was in debt. And that's why she was doing this. Listen carefully. She was in debt. That's why she was doing this. That's why she went to Elijah. Hey, listen, the creditor is coming. I am in debt. 
and I need to do this. So I have a question. Is the church in debt? Is God's church in debt? Well, well let me answer it this way. Romans 6.23 tells us this. The wages of sin is death. Are we in debt? Yes? Yes, yes. When we sin, when man sinned, he was automatically in debt. He was automatically in debt. But, and by the way, we couldn't pay that debt. So you know what happened? Jesus came and gave us a loan. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus came and paid our debt. And then he said, listen carefully, and then he said, all right, I paid your debt. Now you owe me. You owe me because I paid your debt. All right? Not only do you owe me, you owe me with interest. Now we're like, okay, Jesus, how do I pay my debt to you? How do I pay you back? And Jesus says, let me show you how he, let me show you the terms of the loan. Romans 3, 18, oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Our debt that we are in is the debt of love. But I don't know how to pay that debt. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that little oil you have. Not a lot of oil, a pot of oil. I want you to take that pot of oil and I want you to pour out into others. And as you pour out love into others, those who are empty, those who are unfortunate, those who are oppressed, as you do that, church, listen to me, guys, now. Individually, yes, I want you to do this. But I'm talking to you as a church. Because it is not until the church as a body reflects the character of Christ, the church as a body, as the woman it is not until the church as the body begins to pour out in a united effort that the Holy Spirit will fill the church as a body. So yes, I want you to be personally fulfilled or filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, I want you to be filled with the presence of God on a personal level. But beloved, greater than that is when the church, the body of the church itself is filled with the oil and the only way that can happen is if the church as a body recognizes this mission and decides okay we are about to start an oil pouring campaign on a global scale we are about to brainstorm missions of how we can fill empty vessels so that the Spirit of God can be poured out not upon an individual but upon the church We are in debt to God. And the debt, he says, is love. So show love. You can pay me back by loving your neighbor. That's it. Not only do I want, I saved you from keeping the law. I saved you from the law. All right? So now, I want you to keep the commandments. Do not, do not, do not. But on top of that do not, there is interest. The interest is love your neighbor. So not just the don'ts, but I want you to do something. That's the interest. Pay me back. Keep the Ten Commandments. But I need you to understand that there is interest. Not only do I not want you to lie, steal, kill, but I also want you to actively love your neighbor. Actively pour out the Spirit pour yourself out into others and when you do this I will fill you now I want you to notice this Psalm 37 verse 21 the wicked borrow and pay not again I'm gonna just <laughs> oh man
Did you catch that just now? The wicked borrow and pay not again. Thank you, Lord, for giving me mercy. Thank you, Lord, for coming down to this earth and being willing to walk by my side and showing interest in me. Thank you for paying my debt of sin. Now, you want me to do what? You want me to love others? You want me to care about those who are suffering? You want me to actually get out of my comfort zone and go to my neighbors and, and, and do the task of asking them for empty vessels? Ugh. Mm. The wicked borrow and pay not again. Look how the verse finishes. But the righteous show mercy. Wow. Wow. The righteous show mercy and giveth. That's how we pay Jesus back. <laughs> he is the creditor and we're in debt to love. So he says, here's how I want you to pay me back. I want you to love others. And many of us are doing wickedly because we're just not interested in our neighbor's vessels. We want to stay in the house and we want to preach the gospel. We don't want to go out to our neighbor's homes. We don't want to go out to where our neighbors are. We don't want to go out and, 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 and interact with our, with our neighbors on that level. We just want to be comfortable. I need you to notice this. Matthew 25, verse 14, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. In other words, he gave them something. You remember that story? So he takes his journey, and when he comes back, verse 16, then, then he that had five, that had received the five talents, went and traded the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had two talents, he also gained other two. But he that only, that received one, went and digged, his, his, digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. No interest. This one that only had one, preserved what he had, but no interest. I need you guys to catch that. If you think that it is all right for you to just say, I keep the commandments and I don't lie and don't steal, but you are not putting interest on that, which is interest in other people. Huh. I get that now. I just, I saw that in the comment a little bit earlier. I get that now. Thank you, whoever said that. Interest in other people. That's the interest that he's charging us. Oh. If we think that it's okay for us to, to just preserve the law, all right? I'm not doing these things and not putting interest. When the creditor comes back, we're in trouble. You see, beloved, the solution is very simple. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, notice what the Bible says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The only, the, the only thing we need to do, guys, as a Laodicean church, is to open the door to Jesus. If you agree with that, let me just see you say amen or give me some hearts. Yes, pastor, we agree with that. The only thing we need to do is open the door and let Jesus in. That's the solution. Open the door and let Christ in. It's that simple. Je Why is Jesus saying, behold, I'm standing at the door and knocking and you guys aren't opening the door for me. If you let me in, Things will be really good for you. I promise you. Just let me in. Just let me in. So here's my question for you. Why is the church not letting Jesus in? I hope you're sitting down. Why is the church not let? Why is the church having such difficulty letting Jesus in? 
Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. You see, Jesus, listen carefully, guys. Jesus is not knocking at the door as Jesus. I need you. I need that to just sink in for a moment. Jesus isn't knocking at the door as Jesus. He's knocking at the door as someone else. So the reason we're not letting Jesus in is because we don't reckon, we don't see Jesus. What do we see? Oh, that's some poor guy. Knock, knock. I'm knocking at the door. I go to the door. I look through the thing. Who is it? Oh, um, it's some hungry guy. It's some poor guy. It's some guy that won't pull himself up by his bootstraps. It's some guy that's just being lazy, wants handouts. It's some communist, some socialist Marxist. Okay. It's some witch doctor. <laughs> it's some guy that, that just, that is crooked. At it. So, so watch this. If we saw Jesus, we would be like, oh, Jesus, come on in, sit down, have a seat. But because Jesus disguises himself, <laughs> because Jesus disguises himself as someone else, he's knocking at the door and we don't see it as him. We see it as, oh, it's those people that we don't like. So we just not opening the door. We're just not reaching out to them. You see, beloved, watch this. Watch this. Jesus comes in the form of the miserable and the wretched and the blind and the naked. Wait, 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 wait. Isn't that Laodicea's problem? Isn't God describing Laodicea as miserable, wretched, poor, blind, naked? So Jesus... Hmm. Jesus, he comes, remember, when Jesus came to this earth, he didn't come in the glory of God. He came in the likeness of flesh. And not just flesh, sinful flesh. So when he comes knocking at the door of the church, he's not knocking in all his glory. He's knocking as one who is miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. Because he wants to see how do you treat the miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. And when he sees how the church is treating the miserable, wretched, blind, and naked, he says, guys, you are miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. <laughs> Why? Because of the way you are treating the miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. I hope you're catching this. So, in the same Matthew 25, right after he gets this parable of not paying back with interest, with interest, you had no interest. After he addresses that, he then goes right into the parable of the sheep and the goats. And here's what he says. It's the very next verse. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. By the way, How does Matthew 25 begin? It begins with the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. Five are wise, five are foolish. Why are the wise wise? Because they have... Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because they have oil. Why do they have oil? Now we know why they have oil. It's not because they were better prayers than the, than the five foolish. It's not because they studied more than the five foolish. It's because, listen carefully, it's because... <laughs> wow. It's because they were pouring themselves out into others. So first we have the parable of the ten virgins, and then we have this 
this parable of the, of the talents, you're not giving back with interest. You have no interest. And then we have the parable of the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man shall come in all his glory, Matthew 25, verse 31, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. He shall separate them one, one, one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Now, watch this. I'm just going to jump straight to those he says depart to. The goats. Watch this. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. Pause for a second. Pause for a second. Remember when we read in, in, in Revelation 3, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me in, I will come in and eat with you. See, here's what we've been thinking. We've been thinking Jesus has food with him that he wants to share with us. <laughs> wow. That's how we read that text. Jesus says, hey, I'll come in with you. I brought some food. You know, I want to share some food with you. No, 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 no. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm hungry. I'm asking if you would let me into your house so that we can eat. Feed me. Hey, I'm hungry, guys. So what happens in Matthew 25, 42, when Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me no meat. Wait, what? Jesus, when did we ever see you hungry and not feed you? I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. Watch this. Verse 43. I was a stranger. I was at your door knocking. And you chose not to care about me. You chose not to minister to my needs. Why? Because I was a stranger. You thought I was a stranger. You didn't know I was Jesus. Now I know that if I came to you as Jesus, you'd be like, oh, Je is there anything else that you need? Oh, what else can we do for Jesus? I know that. But in order for me to reveal your true heart, I had to come as a stranger. I had to come as the oppressed. I had to come as the downtrodden. I had to come as the hungry. I had to come as the slave. I had to come as the one who is subject to racism. I had to come as the one who is subject to poverty. I had to hide myself because I know what you would have done if you knew it was me. You see, the heart is deceitfully wicked. So I know I had, to, I had to come as someone else. Then shall they also say unto him, Oh, oh, let me finish verse 43. I was a stranger, you took me not in, naked and you clothed me not. Watch this, guys. What is Laodicea's problem? She's got, she's naked. <laughs> she's naked. She's miserable. She's wretched. She's blind. Jesus is saying the way that you get clothed is by clothing others. The way that you are no longer miserable and wretched and blind and naked <clears throat> is by helping those who are miserable and wretched and blind and naked. This is what it means to keep the commandments of God. Watch this, guys. When Jesus comes again, Matthew 25, he doesn't ask, did you not lie? Did you not steal? Did you not kill? Okay, good. You can come in. He doesn't do that. What he asks is, how did you treat the oppressed? We're talking about the investigative judgment, right? Watch this guy. He's not asking, did you have no other gods before me? Did you keep the Sabbath? He's not asking that. What he's asking is, how did you treat the oppressed? Why is he asking that? Because in order to rightly fulfill the law, you have to pay it back, keep the commandments, but with interest. So what are you about to give me here at this judgment? Are you just going to give me back my Ten Commandments and say, I didn't lie, steal, kill? Okay, you buried that in the, you buried my law in the dirt. You buried my law. You didn't give me interest. You mean you didn't, you didn't feed the hungry? 
You didn't clothe the naked. You didn't reach out to those who are oppressed around you. You said it's because they're lazy. It's because they won't pick themselves up by their bootstraps. You said that they need to help themselves. Okay, I got you. Beloved, this is what keeping the commandments look like. You have to pay it back with interest. And the only way you can do that is if Jesus is dwelling in you. And the only way Jesus will dwell in you is if the Spirit of God is in you. And in order to get the Spirit of God in you, you have to pour yourself out into others. And as a church, we're pretty uncomfortable with that. Come listen to my evangelistic series. That's pouring myself out. No, it's not pouring yourself out, guys. <clears throat> that might be the pastor pouring himself out, the evangelist pouring himself out, but it's not you pouring yourself out. So, this is what it means to keep the commandments. Did you catch what I just said? This is what it means to keep the commandments. God's people are called to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. When you put the two together, one is, is paying back the debt of obedience to the law, which Christ does in us, but two is that it must come with interest in others. That's the commandments of God and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, listen carefully. When we do that, we receive something. Come, come, come. Notice Revelation 7, verses 1 and, two, 1 and 2. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind shall not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Pause for a second. What is the seal? We know that the seal of God is the sign of perfection. It is the sign that God's people are reflecting his character. Now, now, I need you to understand this. See, Exodus 31 tells us what this seal is. Exodus 31 verse 13. <clears throat> Speak also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. The Sabbath is the sign that God is sanctifying us. And how does he sanctify us? By filling us with his spirit. Hmm. By filling us with his spirit as we are doing his will. Pouring ourselves out into others is what keeping the commandments is all about. It is outward focused, not inward focused. I am emptying self into others that his spirit might fill me. And when his spirit fills me, then I am sealed. Sealed with what? Sealed with the Sabbath. Why is the Sabbath the seal of God? Listen carefully. Isaiah 58 verse 6. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house? Jesus, knocking at your door. When you see the naked that you cover him, and, and you hide not your own flesh from him. So watch this. The Sabbath, listen carefully. The Sabbath was the flag for oppressed people. I need you to, I need that to sink in for a moment. The God designed the Sabbath to be the symbol for oppressed people. The Sabbath is all about anti-oppression. Yeah, guys, I need you to catch this. The Sabbath was all about anti-oppression. And wherever oppression is found, that's the work of Satan. So, listen carefully, to break God's law will always produce 
oppression. Did you catch that? To break God's law will always produce oppression. So God says, listen, this is the way I want you to keep my Sabbath. The Sabbath was about setting the oppressed free. Isaiah 58 verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as a morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. The Lord will guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought. 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 And make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden. Rain coming down upon God's people. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Why? Because you're pouring water out into other people. Because you are helping the oppressed. Because you are demonstrating to the oppressed that God cares about them and, inv and in, in inviting them to keep the Sabbath, it is the sign that they are no longer being oppressed. Did you catch what I just said, guys? Listen to what Ellen White says. <clears throat> Let me come back to that. I want you to watch this. In Exodus chapter 5, here we go, here we go, and I'm going to come back to this. The light, this is uh, uh, Manuscript Releases, volume 5, page 33. The light is given, this light, and she's quoting Isaiah 58. This light is given to those who keep holy the Lord's Sabbath but watch this guys but we cannot keep this day holy unless we serve the Lord in the manner brought to view in the scripture is not this the fast that I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness pause for a second she just said we cannot keep the Sabbath holy unless we do what Isaiah 58 verse 6 and 7 is saying. Did you catch that? You are not keeping the Sabbath if you are not ministering to the oppressed. You might be going to church on Saturday, but you're not keeping the Sabbath. Because Sabbath keepers are oppression deliverers. They are deliverers from oppression. Or they have been delivered from oppression. So if you're not into the oppressed, if you're not into the downtrodden, if you're not into empathy for, for those who need our assistance in real life practical issues, whatever you're doing, it's not Sabbath keeping. <clears throat> because Sabbath keeping is, is the flag of anti-oppression. You got evidence for that, Pastor? I just shared it, but let me do a little more. In Exodus chapter 5, verse 5, the children of Israel are in Egypt. They are being what? Oppressed. And Moses comes along because God sent him to an oppressed people and, and, and says to Pharaoh, let them go. And notice what Pharaoh says. Behold, the people of the land now are many and you make them rest from their burdens. Check out the Hebrew word for rest there. The word is Shabbat. <laughs> Pharaoh is saying, hold on, you're trying to make the people Shabbat? From their burdens? No, no, no. Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, you shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. No, no, no. No rest from their burdens. Pharaoh was like, you're not going to Shabbat. Watch this, guys. Exodus 5 verse 8. And the tail of the bricks which you did make them he make he heretofore, you shall lay upon them. You shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. 
They're lazy. Therefore, they cry saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon, upon the men and, and that they may labor therein and let them not regard vain words. Beloved, listen to me carefully. The children of Israel could not Sabbath while they were in oppression. Let me say it again. The children of Israel could not Sabbath while they were under the yoke of oppression. God knew this. So what God does is he says, I'm sending Moses and he's going to address their current issues so that he can deliver them out of bondage so that they can truly celebrate Shabbat. What we want to do is just tell people, never mind your oppression, just Shabbat. If we would at least put forth the effort, we may not be able to get people totally out of oppression. We may not be able to get them half out of oppression. But if we can show people that we care about their issues without talking about semantics of, oh, blah, blah, blah. If we can show people that we care and forget about the, 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 the labels that people use and just show people, hey, we care. We care about your issue. If we can show people that we care, if we can mingle with them as one who, sh who, is, who cares about their issues, let me tell you, it would be much easier to preach and demonstrate Shabbat. The Sabbath is a sign of deliverance, guys. And if we're not into deliverance, if we're not into helping our neighbors and pouring out into them and lifting them up out of, out of miserable conditions, literally, then we don't understand the Sabbath. And those who are sealed, beloved, are not those who keep a day. There are those who actually observe the principle of Sabbath. They keep the letter of the law, yes, but they understand that the letter of the law is only half the story. We have a prime message for people who are in bondage, and that is the Sabbath. We ought to be out there in the world telling people, listen, we know you're in bondage, but we're, and we're going to do everything we can. But listen, the sign, the symbol that God has given to us, the symbol that stands against oppression is the Sabbath. You don't think people would, 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 would jump behind that symbol like crazy? What? Yeah. Sabbath. That's the sign of deliverance from oppression. Not just spiritual oppression, but even physical oppression. So we're not going to tell the abused wife, just be happy and keep the Sabbath. No, we are going to intervene and do something. We're going to show that we care about her situation and do something. Are you catching me? We're not just going to look at the family who can't afford to put bread on their table and tell them, be at peace, but keep the Sabbath. No, as a church, we're going to intervene and do something. We're going to lift them out of that bondage the best way we can so that when Sabbath rolls around, there is actually true peace and joy because guess what? I was delivered this week. Now, now I need you to catch this, guys, because there is a counterfeit to the Sabbath. You know what that counterfeit is, right? If the Sabbath represents oppression or, or, or deliverance, if the Sabbath is the symbol of deliverance, then its counterfeit would be the very opposite. Watch this, guys. Oh, man. Remember this, Deuteronomy 5.15, remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt, that the Lord thy God brought thee out hence with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was always connected with deliverance from oppression. So the counterfeit, beloved, listen, there is a counterfeit. There is a counterfeit. We know 
that in the third century, the Sabbath, the symbol of deliverance from oppression, was changed to the first day of the week. So here you see on the screen, very well-known quote, the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. The Pope has authority and has often exercised it to dispense with the command of Christ. And below you see the, the converts catechism of the Catholic doctrine. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is a Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, 364 CE, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now, I need you to understand this because this is fulfilling of Bible prophecy. Daniel 7, 25, he shall think, he shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. I need you to catch this, guys. When the Sabbath commandment was changed, remember, the Sabbath points to anti-oppression. It was changed to another day of the week. And guess what became synonymous with the change of the Sabbath? You want to know what became synonymous with the first day of the week? With Sunday as the church changed it? Guess what the church began to do? According to Daniel 7.25, they began to persecute. I need you to catch this, guys. They began to persecute. If the true Sabbath was connected with deliverance from oppression, then the counterfeit is connected with persecution. I'm not making this up. Just go ahead and research what the church did during the Dark Ages. Research the church's response to heretics. When the church implemented, changed the Sabbath, changed the sign of deliverance from oppression, what happened instead was not deliverance from oppression, but oppression. If you don't do this, we will burn you at the stake. Follow me here, guys. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going somewhere with this. Very interestingly, uh, Christian Experiences and Teaching, page 86, Ellen White says this, I was shown that if the true Sabbath had been kept, there would never have been an infidel or an atheist. The observance of the Sabbath would have preserved the world from idolatry. Wow. Wow. So you mean that atheism and a disregard for the law of God and a rejection of who God is and all these isms, communism and Marxism that we like talking about and all this stuff is a result of professed Christians turning away from the Sabbath? Yes, guys, yes, yes. Let's lay the blame where it is at. The world is following the example of the church when the church said it's okay to ignore the symbol of deliverance from oppression. Stop pointing your finger at the atheists. Stop pointing your finger at the communists. Stop pointing your finger at the person who doesn't believe in God. The reason they don't believe in God, the reason that the communists, the reason for all of this is when the Christian said, hey, we don't need to care about people. All right, hold on. So we're talking about Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. This beast that rose up out, the, out of the sea, and, and, and it had seven, uh, seven, uh, uh, seven heads and ten horns. This is the beast we're talking about, the papacy during the Dark Ages. But watch this, guys. There's another beast that comes on the scene. That beast is found in Revelation 13, 11. And according to the Bible, that beast is exercise the same spirit, the same power as the first beast.
Revelation 12, 13, 12. He exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. What was the power of the first beast? It was the power of persecution. Why are they picking up the same exercises? Why are they picking up the same exercises? Because they picked up the same day. Now guys, watch this. Because some of you, some of you may, may be watching right now who don't know about the Sabbath and you might be going like, Pastor, that's offensive. Hear me out. Listen carefully. <laughs> this day for the slave in America, this day, Sunday, was connected, was inseparable from persecution. Do you catch what I'm saying? In the Dark Ages, it was connected with persecution. In the first beast, it was connected with persecution. In the second beast, it is also connected with persecution. All the slaves knew. Listen, Sunday was symbolic with persecution in the name of Jesus. So during the Dark Ages, we're persecuting you. We're burning you at the stake in the name of Jesus. Second beast of Bible prophecy, it is the same thing. Persecution in the name of Jesus. Oppression in the name of Jesus. Now watch this. There are many who keep the seventh day of the week who are not really observing the Sabbath because they do not have the spirit of anti-oppression, which is the spirit of Jesus who came to set the captives free. Watch this. There are also people who are keeping the first day of the week who have the spirit of Jesus because they have the spirit of anti-oppression <laughs> who do not know that the correct day of worship is the seventh day. And, and when they find out that it is the seventh day and they research and they see this is what God is calling for, guess what? They will keep that day. But beloved, until then, I need you to understand that there are people in other churches who don't have the truth, who have more the spirit of truth than many of us who know the right day but are not acting out the principle of the day. Do you remember what Ellen White said? How those who keep the Sabbath have such a cold spirit that their spirit may be summed up in these words, am I my brother's keeper? You know who said, am I my brother's keeper? Guess who said, am I my brother's keeper? It was Cain. You remember what Cain did? Cain killed his brother. You remember what happened to Cain? Cain received a mark. Y'all not feeling me. <laughs> Cain received a mark. And beloved, what I'm trying to tell you is many of us as Adventists don't realize that we are being set up to receive the mark of the beast simply because we do not care for people. Simply because we do not care for those who are less fortunate than we are. I want you to notice James 2. It's a verse we always quote. James 2 verse 8, it actually begins like this. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you will love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you have respect of persons, in other words, if you judge based off of, well, that person has this or this person is that, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Another translation puts it this way. But if you treat some people better than others, you've done wrong, and the scripture teaches that you have sinned. 
For whosoever shall keep the whole law and get offended in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now if you commit no adultery, yet if you kill, you are become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye and do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. In other words, and look how it ends. For he shall have judgment without mercy that showed no mercy. Whoa. Pastor, keeping the commandments boils down to showing mercy to others, to emptying out to others, not condemning them, not blaming them for their position or their plight. You're in this condition because it's your fault and I'm not going to help you because... I'm closing. I'm closing. When Moses went into, Israel, went into Egypt, he did not tell the children of Israel to keep the commandments of God. You know what he did? He ministered to their needs through the power of God. And after they were delivered out of bondage, then the Bible says God gave them the Ten Commandments. God gave them the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. He delivered them first and then bade them follow him. Closing quote. We need men whose sympathies are not congealed, but whose hearts go out to the perishing that are nigh and afar off. The ice that binds about souls that are frozen up with selfishness needs to be melted away so that every brother shall realize that he is his brother's keeper. Then everyone will go forth to help his neighbor to see the truth and to serve God in acceptable service. Those who profess the name of Christ will aid others in the formation of a Christ-like character. If everyone would work in Christ's lines, much would be done to change the condition that now exists among the poor and distressed. Pure religion and undefiled would gleam forth as bright and shining as a bright and shining light. God's love in the heart would melt away the barriers of race and caste and would remove the obstacles which men have barred others way from the truth as it is in Jesus. True religion will induce its advocates to go forth into the highways and byways of life. It will lead them to help the suffering and enable them to be faithful shepherds going forth into the wilderness to speak and to save the lost, to lead back the perishing sheep and lambs. I'm making an appeal to you. Church, as a body, as a church, we need, as a church, to start pouring out into others in a way that we have not done before. We need to do this. We, we need, as a unit, as a body, we need the church to say, okay, beginning now, beginning next Wednesday, be beginning next Sabbath, we are going to, in an orchestrated manner, start pouring oil out into all the empty vessels of the world. Let's stop ignoring these empty vessels, guys. We see in the story of this woman what is needed for the Spirit to be poured out upon us. Let us search for these vessels. Let us pour ourselves out that we might in fact and indeed be filled with the Spirit of God, the great outpouring, which is to lighten the earth with the glory of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for speaking to us today. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for falling short. 
forgive us for our miserable and wretched condition. Why? Because we look at the miserable and wretched and poor and blind and naked and we point the finger at them. Please, Lord, cleanse us from our ungodly ways and may we as a church get the heart of Jesus so that when you come again and you ask, what have we done? We might be able to answer that the righteousness of Christ was manifested in us that we opened the door when you were knocking. Please, Lord, teach us to identify you in the poor, in the needy, in the oppressed, in the empty vessels of this world, that we may fulfill the mission you've called us to fulfill. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering this prayer. Blessed is our, is our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen.